Thanks, Lucy, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. The Bureau of Meteorology very much highly values its connections with ABARES and DAF. We work very closely with both organisations. And of course, the agricultural and primary industry sector are key stakeholders for the Bureau, so it's a real great pleasure for me to be here representing the Bureau this afternoon. Before we begin, uh, if you will allow me an advertisement, our annual climate statement, uh, our annual climate summary rather, has just been released. Uh, it's available now on the web uh, as a downloadable PDF, but also we now have a highlight video. We're moving more into the, uh, the use of video communication as we move into the 21st century. Uh, and one of our uh, main climate scientists is on that video. So can I commend that to you? It actually is part of our role that's showing on our stand. We had intended that hard copies would be available at our stand today, hot off the press, but apparently the press has got a bit too hot and broke down. So uh, unfortunately they won't be available. I'd like to begin with a quote from a well-known individual of history. And I'll be using a few quotes from the same person throughout the presentation. If we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. That really is a statement of the outline of what I want to talk about today. Where we are, at uh, the tail end of an extreme summer, at, in a decade, really, of extremes. Where are we tending? Well, where have we been in recent decades? Where are we going in coming decades? And in bringing it down more narrowly, the coming season, and meeting that challenge. So where we are, an extreme summer. These photos all taken from uh, over the last month, the fires in Port Lincoln, the, uh, the floods uh, up in uh, towards Bundaberg, and uh, pastures out in the west of New South Wales. Temperatures. Well, the first extreme I'd like to talk about is the one that we talked, that Lucy mentioned, our media release came out on Friday the hottest summer on record. The, uh, that's no news, I guess, to most people who have, have lived through it, but a very extreme summer. Uh, and uh, as the uh, map indicates, the yellow and orange colors are those where it's above average, and the green and blue colors are below average. And for most of Australia, as you can see, apart from the Pilbara, it was exceptionally above, uh, it was an above average year. And in some areas, the tan color, two to three degrees above average. Uh, averaged across Australia, the temperature was 28.6 degrees above the long term. And of course, as we'll, you'll recall, the most extreme of that heat occurred in the first three weeks of January. And of course, January was the hottest month on record. A feature of this summer has been heat waves. Two major widespread continental scale heat waves. The first of them actually technically wasn't in summer, it was the tail end of spring, late, uh, late November, 24th of November to the 30th of November. And this map indicates the highest temperature that was achieved uh, in, those, in that period over Australia, with that uh, darkest brown colour being above 45 degrees. So as you can see, a, a very significant heat wave, but in particular severe because it was so early in the season. As you'd be aware, particularly for human health and animal and plant health, when a heat wave occurs early out of season, it actually can do more damage or more harm. The second heat wave was the one I've already mentioned in January. The very first three weeks, exceptionally hot, exceptionally long, exceptionally widespread, in fact, unprecedented in our recorded history. The highest temperature was 49.6 degrees, recorded at uh, Moomba in South Australia. And overall, uh, on the 7th of January, the Australian temperature averaged over the whole continent reached 40.3 degrees, a record. And of course, with the heat came the fires. Uh, in the build-up to the season, we had a, uh, an indication that it was going to be a bad season, particularly for grass fires. Two very wet years preceding had meant there had been significant grass growth and of course therefore uh, a lot of fuel, potential fuel, and of course a dry winter and spring as shown in this, uh, this diagram here indicates the, uh, it was, uh, led to the drying of that fuel, the, the, the provision of that high load. 
match, match that with the extreme temperatures, and of course the result was significant, uh, and in fact uh, very devastating fires in some locations in every state and territory. The Bureau actually uh, issues spot forecasts. When a fire starts, the fire agency asks the Bureau to produce forecasts for that location. And during January, there were a record number of such spot, spot forecasts uh, issued, over uh, 1,500 of them in the month of January, by far a record above anything we'd have to do, deal with before. So a very severe fire season. Moving from fires to tropical cyclones. And this is a uh, uh, photograph taken last week, in fact, from the uh, International Space Station uh, by the commander of the station, Chris Hadfield, showing Cyclone Rusty, just as it was approaching the Australian coastline. From space, cyclones have a majestic beauty about them, which belies the uh, awful destructiveness that they impart at the ground. Cyclone Tr Tr Rusty was, of course, just one of several cyclones this year. There were five in the, that impacted in the Australian region. Uh, Mitchell, Morell, Oswald, Peter, and we don't have a Q name to use, so dropping to Rusty. This map gives uh, an indication of the tracks. The one on the uh, eastern coast, of course, was Oswald, which will feature a bit later in what I'm talking about in terms of the rainfall, and the four that were experienced over in WA, and the last one being Rusty, which made landfall uh, near Port Hedland. And of course, in addition to the east coast, uh, to the cyclones, we also had quite a significant east coast low. As, as a, as a similar sort of beastie, but different, uh, and it certainly tends to impact on the east coast of Australia, as the name implies, and you'd probably be aware that that occurred in uh, late February and brought significant rainfall with it to the east coast of Australia, from the surface paradise to the Gold Coast, down uh, the north coast and central coast of New South Wales in particular. Well, as I mentioned, the cyclones brought with them rain. They weren't the only cause of rain, but they were a significant cause. Very heavy December rainfall occurred in southwest Western Australia, so, and uh, Cyclone Oswald, as I mentioned, brought very heavy rainfall uh, to the east coast of uh, New South Wales, with some centres uh, recording up to 700 mils in one day and quite a number over 400. Um, the map here is what's known as a decile map. So where the colour is blue, the, uh, it's above average for that time of year. So this is the summer uh, rainfall map. So above average where it's blue, below average where it's red, and the deepest blue is highest on record, and the deepest red is lowest on record. And as you can see, um, large parts of the East Coast and significant parts of Western Australia, particularly the Southwest and the Pilbara, are uh, above average rainfall. And that's the story I guess the media has tended to focus on and where public interest has, uh, has fallen. But of course, you can see clearly from that for most of Australia, it's actually been uh, a fairly dry summer for Victoria, Tasmania, Western New South Wales, inland Queensland, South Australia, and uh, the, the top end uh, where the monsoon was delayed and uh, not a very productive one in terms of rainfall. Uh, just as an aside, I'd like to uh, indicate the forecast we had for that s summer. And this is the forecast the Bureau put out. The greens and blues indicate where the chances are above, of above average rain are higher, and uh, the yellows and reds where the chance of above average rain is lower than 50%. And as you can see, we're the, the map gives indication that we, there was a higher chance of rain in the east and in the west, roughly corresponding to where it fell. So this forecast wasn't too bad. And of course, with the rain came the floods. Some years, uh, some summers, summer of course is a traditional severe extreme weather season in Australia. Some years bring the fires, some years bring the floods. This year was somewhat unusual in that it brought both, sometimes at the same time, uh, in different places, but sometimes at the same time across the continent. This map indicates where there were major floods over, well, the red triangles indicate major floods, the orange ones moderate, and the green triangles minor flooding. But focusing on where the major floods are, as you can see, along the uh, Pacific coast of Queensland, focusing on that southeast corner, and then also the north coast of New South Wales. Significant and major flooding. Uh, in particular, a lot of that was associated with uh, Cyclone 
Oswald, and uh, as you probably saw, remember from the cyclone track, it sort of meandered inland a bit, a bit unusual for a cyclone to do that, uh, and caused very significant rain uh, and consequent flooding along that part of uh, Queensland and into New South Wales. The Burnett River and the Clarence River uh, in that period reached record fl flood peaks. And of course, we're aware from, uh, the Bureau's aware from its observations, and I guess you're aware from the media, those, that floods have continued to occur through the month of February uh, with heavy rains from different sources. So all in all, a very, very extreme summer. So where are we? Well, the, uh, the famous poem, of course, of Dorothy McKellar talks about our droughts and flooding rain, so we know that it's been part of our history going back decades and eons that we live in a highly variable climate. But this past decade has been particularly marked by extremes of climate. Firstly, the, the decade began in the midst of the millennium drought. Uh, this graph indicates the variation from average of rainfall across the Murray-Darling Basin. So where the bar is blue, it's above average. Where the bar is down and, and red, it's below average. And the black line gives the decadal average over, that pe over the period. So as you can see, um, highly variable from year to year, uh, as uh, we've noted, very variable climate. Uh, and also, if you notice the black line, that also is very highly variable. Australian climate is quite variable at the annual level, but also at the decadal level. But I'd like us to focus on this last period here, which is uh, quite distinct in the record, a very extended period of below average rain, which we now call the millennium drought, given that it occurred at the uh, turn of the millennium. The other significant periods, of course, in Australian history are around our Federation, the Federation drought, and of course, around World War II, sometimes called the World War II drought. So, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, the, the drought started in around 1997. Depending a little bit on where you were, it started that period in Victoria. It spread north a bit later. Uh, but, it, but it was ended abruptly, obviously, in 2009 by the La Niñas that we experienced. It was uh, largely limited to the southeastern part of, uh, of the continent. Uh, so not, it wasn't universal over the whole of the Australian continent, and particularly uh, southeastern Australia, southeastern Queensland, and of course, western, uh, southwestern WA, where the dry conditions there have been really uh, are continuing on from about the 70s. The uh, rainfall decline wasn't uniform across the year. It was actually most pronounced in autumn. About two-thirds of the decline, in fact, was in autumn. So very significant seasonality to the dry period. And it's the driest period on record for those areas that were affected, southeastern Australia, particularly Victoria and southern New South Wales, and therefore including the ACT. So very dry beginning to the decade. Broken, interrupted, brought to a very abrupt end by two La Niñas. The first, of course, 2010 to 2011, and these are these same decile maps, and uh, you can see the difference, the absence of red, or the relative absence of red. Uh, in the first La Niña, the stronger of the two, July to March, July 2010 to March 2011, basically large areas in the top 10% of years, and large areas, in fact, uh, highest on record, with only southwest of WA continuing in dry conditions uh, for that month. Extreme rainfall. The following year, we had our second La Nina, not as strong as the first, but as you can see, uh, a more uniform effect, including southwest to WA. Still very strong, so still with well above average rainfall, and of course, with those rains came, of course, quite tragically, uh, uh, loss of life and indeed loss of property. When those two years are added together as an event, so July 2010 to March 2012, we have record-breaking rainfall. So the highest two-year total, the highest two-year period of rainfall on Australia, in Australia's uh, recorded history going back to when we can do these sorts of records to about 1900. The uh, first uh, La Nina was not the strongest we've ever had, that is 1972, but it was basically the second strongest, and the two combined form the two uh, the, the largest two-year event that we've experienced. But interestingly, even though we've had this very wet period, the dry autumn winters have continued. This is the autumn and winter decile map for between the two La Ninas, 
And as you can see, apart from the top end and the Kimberley and parts of the east coast of uh, New South Wales, and that was largely due to an east coast low event, uh, most of the continent was drier than average over that winter. So the pattern of dry uh, autumns and winters that was established in the millennium drought has effectively continued on. Well, where are we? So that's where, we've, where we are, a, an extreme summer in an extreme decade. Where are we tending? Where are we going? I'd like to focus on temperature for two reasons. I guess it's the simplest and most certain in terms of our records and also in terms of projections. And to a large degree, it's the temperature that drives the climate system and the weather systems. It's the temperature is e effectively an equivalent term for energy. And that's the, what gives the energy to the weather and climate system of the globe. And so it's, a, it's a, a good measure. It also happens to be one of the ones we can model the best and also we, that we have some of the most comprehensive records on. This uh, graph gives you the trend over uh, this century of temperatures for Australia, averaged over Australia. Uh, the orange line is the annual figure for Australia, and as you can see, as so with rainfall, so with temperature, highly variable from year to year. Uh, some years hotter than others, some years colder than others, <coughs> and quite significantly so. Uh, the black line, as previously, gives you the decadal average, but in this case you can see, although there are squiggles up and down, there's a more monotonic sort of uh, increase to, uh, in, in the, the, the line. And indeed, the last 10 years, the 20, 2001 to 2010, is the, uh, has been the hottest decade on record. Uh, and the, the grey bars actually indicate the decadal averages. And so 2001 2010 is the, the dark band bar behind the light grey bar. So each decade has been warmer than the previous decade, since about the 1950s. And since uh, our temperature records began, uh, we've increased by about 0.75 degrees Celsius since about 1910. 1910. The reason 1910 is because that was when all temperatures were standardized into the little white boxes you see at Bureau Weather Station. So it is a consistent way of measuring temperature. So that's where we've been. Highly variable, but with a steadily rising warming trend uh, with this last decade, 2001-2010, uh, the warmest on record. That's the recent past. Where are we heading? Uh, I chose one graph to illustrate this. Uh, it's from a report that was done jointly by the CSIRO and the Bureau a few years ago. And what it shows is the projections for the area of land, uh, of a, of in this case Queensland, but the results are similar for other states, the percentage of land ex experiencing exceptionally hot year with Queensland as an example. The red line gives the average of the models and the brown sort of plume around those gives the range of the model runs. And as you can see, uh, basically the first half of the century, things trundle along, uh, expected to trundle along close between zero and five percent of Queensland experiencing a hot or exceptionally hot year. But when you get around 1960 and it starts to trend up uh, until by the time you get to 2040, 80 percent of, uh, of the state is expected to experience an exceptionally hot year each year. The black line gives the observations. And as you can see, the models are doing a pretty good job so far. The future is going to be very different from the past. Later this year, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, will issue its fifth uh, assessment report, at Working Group 1, which is looking at the climate science, and that will give the most up-to-date information on both the trends that we've observed in the past and what models are saying for the future. And shortly after that, new Australian projections will follow that are being worked on uh, jointly by CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology and other agencies. So where are we tending? A warm past into a warming future. The best thing about the future, if I may quote by an anonymous source, the best thing about the future is that it comes only one day at a time. We face an exceptionally challenging future, but we can, I think, take some reassurance from the fact that we face it one weather event at a time, one season at a time, one year at a time. And that brings us down to, well, what's the next season bring? 
where are we tending in this coming season? This is the Bureau outlook for minimum temperatures, so overnight temperatures for autumn for this year. And as you can see, we're expecting the, where the reds and yellows are a greater chance of above average, the blues and greens are where there's a reduced chance of above average uh, temperatures. And as you can see, the, uh, uh, for Victoria, southern su South Australia, parts of southern New South Wales and Tasmania, a reduced chance of above average, so we flip that over, an increased chance of below average uh, overnight temperatures. But for significant parts of uh, nearly all of, virtually all of Queensland and for large parts of WA and for northern New South Wales, an increased chance of higher overnight temperatures. Uh, as I've said there, the, this uh, forecast is actually a result of warmer than normal ocean temperatures in the Indian Ocean rather than what's happening in the Pacific where conditions are looking uh, like they're neutral. The green map uh, on the bottom left-hand corner is an indication of how well our forecasts have done at this time of year uh, uh, previously, so historical accuracy. So where the map is green, it's done actually a, a reasonable job, a job better than climatology. As you can see, for minimum temperatures, uh, it's done pretty well. This is the equivalent map for maximum temperatures, uh, and basically you can see for most of southeast uh, Australia extending into the inland, cooler than average temperatures are expected, uh, over daytime temperatures are expected in autumn, except with the exception of the tropical north and also uh, the southwest uh, parts of uh, Western Australia, we're above average temperatures. The skill is not quite so uniform, um, the historical accuracy is not, is not so uniform on that, but is particularly high in the northern half of the country and around Victoria. So moving though to rainfall, this is the uh, outlook for rainfall, and again the same pattern applies, greens and blues above average, uh, increased chance of above average, yellows and oranges uh, increased chance of below average rainfall. And as you can see, it's foreca the forecast is largely for increased chance of lower rainfall in Tasmania, uh, at least southern Victoria, south of the ranges, southwest WA, but relatively neutral where it's white or indeed chance of above average in the places where it's green, so south Australia into inland Queensland and parts of the Pilbara in WA. Um, and this forecast is, uh, the Bureau is forecasting neutral conditions to continue in the Pacific, so neutral means neither La Nina nor El Nino. So uh, the Pacific is really not factoring strongly into this. The results are largely, uh, uh, the, where the wetter signal is, is a larger result of warmer waters in the Indian Ocean. However, uh, model skill is pretty low at this time of year as can be seen from the historical accuracy map, where the area that's green is largely the tropics and southwest WA. So a note of caution that uh, this is a time of year called the autumn predictability barrier where all models, both the bureaus and the international models, all struggle at this time of year uh, to, get the, uh, to get high skill, high reliability at this time of year. Uh, the other important thing to note is this, none of these forecasts, neither the rainfall forecast nor the temperature forecasts give any information over the spread of that phenomena over the, over the uh, season, uh, nor on extremes that might occur in the season. So they're quite limited. They give you a sense of whether you get above average over the whole three months, but it doesn't say whether that will all come in one day or spread out nice and easy, evenly as a drizzle over the whole three months. It doesn't have any information on the spread, it doesn't have any information on extremes, uh, other than the fact that when it's highly green and blue, there's a greater chance, obviously, in terms of rainfall, that there will be extreme rainfall events when it's going to be large above average, but it doesn't give you any specific information about extremes. So, meeting the challenge. Where are we? We're in a warming world after having a, had a very exceptionally extreme summer in an exceptionally extreme, extreme decade. The war world is warming. It's likely in that warming world that we'll face a future that is different from the past with a higher frequency and severity of at least some extremes, particularly those associated with temperature, but quite possibly also in terms of rainfall. How do we meet that challenge? Well, the Bureau has a role to play, and that is partly indicated by here by our vision statement. To provide Australians with environmental intelligence, that is with the climate information, the weather information, the water information that they need for safety, primarily our number one priority, 
sustainability, well-being and prosperity. The Bureau, I guess, has always been seeking to do this and will continue to do so. Uh, and as part of that, uh, we of course are the, uh, the collectors and the custodians of Australia's climate uh, record and uh, seek to protect that for, for future <coughs> generations, but also to constantly monitor and uh, analyse what's happening with the Australian climate. But the Bureau in particular, I'd like to, to conclude this talk by focusing on two specific uh, activities that we're engaging in, one that we are engaged in already and one we're proposing to engage in, to seek to provide tools uh, for the Australian community, particularly for the agricultural sector, to help meet the challenge that we face in this, uh, with this new future ahead of us. Firstly, we're moving to a dynamic model. Um, those, the other seasonal forecasts I've just shown are produced by what's known as our statistical model. Uh, that basically means we look back at the past and what happened in the past and on the basis of what conditions are like now compared to what they were like then, uh, we, we get an estimation of what we think will happen now. So it's based on the history and of course one of the issues with that, there are two issues of course, if the climate is changing then the past may no longer be a very reliable guide to the future. So it has a problem in that regard. But it also has a significant problem that the, the lowest resolution we can do for on the seasonal scale is really three months. And as I said before, it doesn't give you any information on the spread of the phenomena, uh, whether it's all in one day or whether it's spread nice and evenly over the three months, it doesn't give you information on the extremes. Moving to a dynamic model where you might actually model the system on a computer with all the physics and so on included uh, is becoming possible now because the advances in computer science in terms of computer power, but also very importantly on the amount of information data we can feed into that model. The Bureau currently ingests over six million pieces of data a day into our computer model that we run for weather prediction. And that information and, we're, and that model, the same model that's being used for weather prediction is now being developed and adjusted uh, in, in what is called a unified model so we can also use it for seasonal forecasting. And that model is already running, but this year we'll actually move to that being our operational model from which we issue forecasts. We're also seeking as part of that exercise to improve uh, the user-focused design to make it actually uh, easier for people to understand and to use and therefore to have greater impact and take up of that forecast. Uh, the, the use of the dynamic model also provides us the opportunity for a greater a range of products. So as well as just doing temperature and rainfall, we can potentially extend into humidity, into pressure, into other variables that might be of interest to people. And uh, we can also move to other time frames. So at the moment, we weather forecasting we do up to about a week, then we've got the three months uh, forecast we do. We'll be able to bridge that gap in between with multi-week forecasts, next fortnight, next month, second month out and so on. Uh, and we hope to move to that relatively soon after the introduction of the model in the year, so the couple of years following. It also allows the possibility of tailoring to sector needs, so indices that are of particular relevance to certain industries can be generated uh, from the outputs of the model and so on. As a particular example of that, uh, I'd like uh, to, to highlight uh, something, a, 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 a uh, one of our strategic priorities over the next few years is to develop a weather and climate extremes risk service, taking advantage of the capabilities that the dynamic model will bring uh, across all time scales, uh, from days, weeks, out to seasons, and potentially out even to decades. So quest answering questions like what's the chance of exceeding 50 mils or 100 mils or 200 mils in the next few days or in the next few weeks, in the next few months? Um, what's the chance of having five days in a row above a certain temperature that is of critical importance to your uh, particular industry or, or whatever? What is the historical, what's the risk in our historic climate? What's going to be the risk in any future climate we have and so on? Uh, and as part of this exercise, the Bureau will be seeking to partner with key stakeholders uh, across various sectors and our initial focus is going to be with agriculture, but we also obviously see great potential uh, for this sort of uh, service as we move in the areas of insurance and disaster risk reduction uh, and so on. So where have we been? Where are we? Where have we been? Where are we? Uh, a very extreme summer in what has really been a decade of extremes. Where are we tending? Well, we've seen that there's been a, uh, a warming over the past uh, decades that is expected to continue, and with that warming, uh, a very increased likelihood of, uh, of uh, severe weather extremes, uh, both in the terms of um, severity and, 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 uh, and frequency. 
particularly in temperature, potentially also in rainfall, uh, and obviously that poses a great challenge to us as a, a community and to particular sectors and industries. As we look forward though, my final, my final quote, and this may help you work out who is the person I've been quoting, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. Our future and perhaps indeed already our present are very different from the past. And as we meet the challenges of the future, it will be necessary for new thinking, new tools, new services uh, to meet those, those needs and the Bureau is keen to do that. Uh, in case you're wondering, I think I've got the name here. No, I don't. In case I'm wondering, Abraham Lincoln uh, has been the person I've been quoting, uh, facing a very different challenge, of course, to the one we had, that we face ahead. But of course, as I mentioned before, we face the future one season at a time, one year at a time. Thank you.